Well, whoa. So where are we going? Oh, here. look, just here to start with. My goodness me. What's that? So what is this? Do you remember this? I never did anything like no, this. I, I mean, it looks... Uh, it looks... Uh, pretty much just like an edit controller, an early version of DVE-800, yeah. We're just working yeah, out what's here? Just working out, looks sort of like a 600, obviously a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, two shuttle knobs, one for each machine. Um, assume it's 422 control, yes. And what have we got? Edit. So you've got one for... As the player yeah. players died out there. So I suppose the important thing to say is that this was a cuts only device and it could be from tape one to the other one. Yes. So the process was you'd control one machine and record it onto the other one. Correct. And you'd mark it in and out and then it would go across to the record deck. And uh, synchronization to get the two to the edit point at the right time. You get the player and the recorder at the point you selected. Uh, um, which is what most all edit controllers yeah, did. Yeah, so you had a preview, so you could so you preview, could practice the edit, so practice the edit, and then you press it. the red button when you were happy. Oh, I don't know where we are here. But their uh, edit controllers are pretty similar, actually. They just have more features the later on you go into the uh, time frame. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a shuttle knob and. Which one's the top one? Is the recorder? Uh, Presumably, there's a mark in. And Presumably, a that's what I'm looking, looking for. for. I'm just exactly oh, what I'm looking for at the moment. Go to in out. No, I'm not sure that's the mark in. Is it? Let's, let's go to in and the out. Is that? A, oh, I we think haven't you can mark it and go to. Yeah, but we haven't marked one yet, have we? No. I think they're here, aren't they? Player recorder in, so recorder. Is that simply a one touch? I don't know. Go to in. Uh, this doesn't seem to be working, does it? Every time. <laughs> go to in. Go to. Go to. It's not doing it, is it? Why is it not doing it? Recorder, recorder, in, out. There's the marker. Entry. Ah, look. Okay, there we are. It's a big button there. Look, it says entry. So, I guess you go recorder. So, so uh, is that marked one? That one made one. Let's see if it goes to in now. Oh. What's going on, Phil? Personally, I've never seen one of these in my life. <laughs> um, why doesn't that work? Yeah, that's not toggling, is it? It's not toggling. That's not toggling. Because you've got to Maybe do two on. fingers. I don't know. No. Well, I don't know. Rec recorder. See, it's not, not got no. a little light on, is it? I don't know. I don't quite understand that. It must it must be solvable. Um, so what does that do? This is interesting. Uh, got the time code in the screen up there on the little LED display, which is very much like a 600 that I am used to. So that is the recorder you're that's playing the with. Side there. So let's the try marking it out on that. Well, that's what I'm doing. So we go. Let's let's go at the top of that. Go to the bottom and mark at the bottom of the pan up. So if we go recorder, why is that not changing? Why is that saying P1? It says P1, it no, won't no, change to recorder. Player one or player yeah, two. But, it, but it's not that, that button. No. I would have thought recorder in. It's not doing it, is it? I don't know why. That's... No, this is a bit of a mystery. A, B, roll. In out total no, come on. What does that do? So if we if we make a, a player within an out, it should go. And it should do. Yeah, it should do. But it can't. 
there's no inn, is there? No. It's not making an inn. It doesn't seem to be working, I'm afraid. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure it's I us. I think that would go... I, I reckon yeah. it's us. So player. Can't get rid of player there. That's your player. There's your player. Oh, have we got any material on the player? Going backwards, are we? Oh, we're at the front of the tape. There's the... Oh, it's a bit temperamental. It's... I don't know whether there's anything on here. Oh, there we are, yeah, there's a picture. Sort of. It's in tape, it's not in... It's in EE, isn't it? It's not in tape EE, I'd guess. On the... Uh, one of these buttons here should be... Uh, as I said, I've never driven these machines, really. Let's just come round and have a look. Is it in the tape EE switch? I can't see it. I think the player is not playing ball with us here. We're trying to uh, mark an in on the player and mark an in and out on the recorder and preview and edit. We won't do one just in case we mess the tape up, but at the moment we are struggling to try and work out which button does which on this controller because, as I said, I've never actually seen one of these in my life before. Um, I used an earlier version, but this one, they've added some features that I don't know about. What's well, my memory of these? I've never seen one of these in my life. So, but as we were saying, that the, the functionality is very similar to other things, and basically this can control two players and one recorder, and you can choose which one is which. And at the moment, we can't find out how to mark an in and an out. This should be, should be very Yes, it is actually going back somewhere. So. This mm -hmm. monitor seems to be looking That's at the, the recorder. recorder. That's the recorder, yeah. yeah. And I can't find it. And this is the player, That's so the we're player trying to find play. something to transfer from there to so there. We, so if we just play, the, just play the player and see if it's going to play ball, it's not very happy at the moment. So if we mark an in somewhere... With it running. With it running, and then hit that one, does that move? Is that... I think it's the recorder's back. trying to look for something. The player doesn't seem to want to play ball still. It's still playing, isn't it? Player. Yeah. The player will work in... The player seems to work in freeze mode, but not in any other mode. That's a bit of a shame. Yeah, good job. Was the... I don't quite know why it's doing that. Well, you would normally have a pre-stripe black and burst tape in your recorder starting at whatever time code you wanted. I mean, if it was just a gas tape, it would start at zero time code. If it was a to program you were making, normally our programs would start at 10 hours. So you go 9.59, 59 would be one second before the program started. Program started at 10, and you would start, put your first entry at um, 9.59, 58, which was two seconds before the start of the program, which gave the uh, network a couple of seconds to get into the show. Put, put down your first shot, mark an in, mark an out. If you had an out, perhaps you didn't have an out, you had a long sequence that you just marked an in on both machines, hit the red button or the preview if you wanted to rehearse it first. And then you would copy from the player to the recorder, whether it be sound, vision, both, whatever, until you'd had enough and you wanted to stop, then you'd stop and that edit would then be stored. Um, and you would then start find the next sequence that you wanted in your show and on a machine like this it was cut edit only you couldn't do dissolves because uh, there was to my knowledge no method of driving a mixer off these although you could do it by some sort of bodging and frigging which is what I used to do with a, a similar machine I think they had a GPI if you wanted I think to. correct yeah. you're right there Phil yes they used to be which is what I used to do it could generate a GPI which could trigger a vision mixer to to do a mix or a wipe I um, mean, it was a bit Heath Robinson, but yeah. it, it did used to work. And so for the uninitiated, all of these bits of equipment having were Sony, and Sony had a language and an alphabet. So this is called a BVE... 800. 800. So that's Broadcast okay. Video yeah, Editor. So B was Broadcast, V was Video, E was Editor, and then U was Umatic. And, and it became the industry standard. So... Blacking a tape, we keep mentioning it, but no one would know what that meant unless you'd done it. A tape won't record unless in an edit system 
unless it's already been what we would call striped with a black video and a time code. And time code gives every single frame an exact reference to edit to. And one frame is 25th, 25th of, a of a second, second and, a and, um, and 30th of a, of a second in America, just to make it easy to understand. Um, but we're not quite sure why. There's definitely blacked because it's got time codes. Yes. I mean, the only, the only time you didn't actually need to have a, a blacked tape or a striped tape, whatever you want to call it, was if you were assemble editing. Now, assemble editing was exactly what it says. You were making an assembly, so that would then record its own control track and time code and vision without having to have a track, a black and burst track underneath it. But you would very seldom use that for making programs because it was very difficult to continue because of the difference of the machines and trying to get a particular tape to edit in another machine was very difficult. So you would always for a program put down a control track which was black level, time code and burst, so full color signal but just black, silence because you didn't want any spurious sounds cropping up during your edit. So the first part of your session before and during lineup would well could well be making this control track tape for the duration of the show that you were making and then when the producer came in you could then start and do his side of it which was the edit your side was the technical bit to get the tape into a situation where you could use it we are having a little bit of trouble getting this edit controller to work and i'm rather annoyed with myself that i can't work it out is there an assemble button maybe? Yes, there is assemble an assemble mode. button there. Is this out? If we're in insert, so that, that's okay. So, no, you've probably got to switch that off to put that on. So the buttons allow us to choose whether we're transferring all of it, which is assemble, or video and audio, or just video and audio. And we can select that there. And at the moment, we've got video just only. Video. Um, and we're trying to find the mark in which doesn't seem to work that's all uh, this this these machines had two audio tracks later on uh, the number of tracks went up to four and even eight much later on with the digi beta um, via clever external boxes um, these umatic from my experience were used for offline editing because the machines themselves were relatively cheap controllers were relatively cheap and, and an editor could sit in, an, in a little room, a not expensive room with the producer and go through all his rushes, that is the stuff that comes off the camera, out the studio, whatever, make the decisions up there rather than having to sit in a very expensive online suite um, and make those decisions there because every minute there you could be wasting £50. Much better to spend £2 in your offline suite uh, making those decisions than £50 in an online suite. And these sort of things we would use in a truck, maybe, after a football match to do a... In, in America they call it a video news release of a quick few clips of the goals or something like that. And then you would transmit that at the end of the programme for the news feeds to take. And they were allowed in America to take one minute for free. Don't know what it is over here. Uh, the only difference was at the time the machinery worked and it's not working yet. <laughs> we can talk about the rollback and mix. That was done because post-production had no mixing, video mixing or wiping in those days. When we did shows like The Good Life, I seem to remember doing it on back in the early 70s, because the studio had a vision mixer, obviously, and um, what we would do, there would be another machine, so you'd have three machines, uh, downstairs in VT, two of them would be recording because we always had a main and a backing and you'd have another machine which was the rollback and mix machine. Now what that would do, you'd come to the end of the scene, you'd stop, there'd be a costume change or whatever it was and if some sort of transition of time that they wanted to put an effect in and the rollback and mix machine would go back beyond the last cut in that scene run it in and at the desired point the director would cue the artist and then the vision mixer would mix across to the live action so then you had a tape recorded on your main recordings you had the outgoing scene and then you had the, the outgoing scene again with the new effect on it so what you had to do was join the outgoing scene to the new incoming scene and that's why we went back to a cut because 
it was virtually impossible in those days to make a join not on a camera cut because of the power sequence. So that was quite fraught. It was very limiting in as much as you had to make that decision there and then in the gallery. There was none of this, I'll rehearse it that way, rehearse it this yeah. way, try this, try that. None of that in the 70s. You did it and if it went, if the director at the time was happy, that had to be it and that was it forever. You couldn't go back and do it again. And that was um, just another little trick that, that happened in, in the 70s. And vertical interval time code also then meant that offline systems like this, you could look at those, run, run these tapes through a machine that could read these, the, the time code of the original tape. You could preserve the original time code from the original tape and transfer that onto your edit tape in here. And so you, could, you had a direct reference then back to your original material. So that brought in the, the, the thing called conforming, where editors would make the program on, on this cheap machinery, but there was the reference back to the original broadcast quality tape and that could then be conformed in a high quality suite uh, to make your program with original quality material. That, that was the start of offline editing, which progressed, as we know, uh, getting a bit ahead of myself here to, to uh, non-linear systems, but the time code was a big, big change, one of the big changes. So this is a 900, isn't it? Yeah. 910, actually. 910. So moving on, this would have been early early 80s, I think. Um, Sony very significant in the transition to enabling facility houses to open because until then, as we said earlier, uh, tape decks quad were over two hundred thousand pounds. Suddenly they're thirty two thousand one inch, and they got more facilities, and. Um, and Sony developed uh, a much more sophisticated, uh, QWERTY-based, effectively, these keys are all what they call them, soft keys. They've been programmed to do specific things. So now we could control anything up to eight machines, I recall, and run them all at the same time in sync, so that with a vision mixer in the middle, like this is a vision mixer, this is a very small one, built by Grass Valley, and. In the day, we always used to say, you never lose your job for buying a Grass Valley, because it worked, and it worked very reliably. And, and sometimes you could program through the keyboard a dissolve of, say, 30 frames, and it would do it automatically, run up all the decks and do the dissolve at precisely the right moment uh, and transfer to the master tape. Um, and, and if you, sometimes you wanted to do it manually because there's something different, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, there's something about a human doing things sometimes that's different to a machine. And so sometimes you want, uh, maybe you wanted half mix and things like a half mix were very difficult to program if you could at all. And then on top of that, and I think it's worth saying at the time that in my day in the early eighties, we would, the editor would do everything, including the editing and the audio and the, and the graphics. So we had a machine, which we haven't got here, called an Aston character generator, where we could make all the lower thirds. So my job in that day was to make all of that first thing of the day. Uh, you make the end roller and all the lower thirds, and then you'd put them on as you went. And what you, by then, you, we can see here, we're building an edit list. Location stuff started coming in on Beta SP and we had one of these suites very similar to this actually with a BVE 900. It was just the predecessor of this there, one. Yeah. Um, There's one down there between the machines. Yes. So this is Beta SP. So we've gone, we've gone from this to this in about 12 or 13 years, um, which is fairly typical for the industry, an exponential um, arrival of technology. So we're getting um, camera tapes coming from OBs or what have you. In my particular case, it was Ski Sunday. The uh, tapes would come back from the ski resort on a Friday or a Saturday morning, and we'd have to make the little start of the show, which involved a lot of vision mixes. Now, 
doing that on one inch was impossible out in the big area that we had at Television Centre and they didn't want to pay for a suite. So we had one of these. So we had one, one tape with all the bits on it. So we wanted to mix to the other one. So we had to copy off, make copies of every alternate shot to another beta tape, two beta players, one beta recorder, just like we have here. Point out what a mach beta machine is. This is a, this is a, which is the recorder? Nothing, I'm not taping it, is it? So this is a Betacam SP. Um, helical scan, as, I, as, as was the Umatic actually, but of a much higher quality. It's a composite machine, composite video, analog machine basically. Uh, first brought out by Sony in 80... Around 80, 80, mid 80s. Uh, yeah, mid 80s. Um, the first time BBC post-production used one in real anger was at the Calgary Olympics in 88. But I say I was using them on the little suite with, with an edit controller to make the little sequences with dissolves because the, as Phil has explained, the edit controller can talk to the mixer via a, a 422 link, which is basically a nine pin cable. So the, this controller, which has a chassis uh, somewhere, it, it, this is not all of it, there is a, a, a big chassis that goes with it. And that will talk not only to the videotape machines, it will also talk to the vision mixer. So you can do everything from this little keyboard, which makes it much more relaxed way to work. You're not fighting with, like in the two inch days, you were fighting with the tapes and fighting with the controls and stepping back and walking here and there. You do it all from here. So it became more difficult to learn the basics of editing as soon as single um, controller operation came into being. That's actually a good point and something I should explain because we know and we're too close is all this kit would probably be in a technical area up the corridor with one engineer who perhaps loaded tapes uh, as opposed to us loading tapes. Yes. So, yeah. Um, and, um, and, and that was the moment really when facility houses came into being in the early 80s in London and, and P even the BBC would co book facility houses maybe because you had a special effect they didn't have or wanted and, and they would book, book it by the hour and pay by the hour and this here which we haven't pointed out yet is the sound desk Limited facilities, this one, but enough for what we used to do. Yes, agreed. Yes, you didn't. You had yeah. uh, on Beta SP. You only really had two, <coughs> two usable soundtracks. The, the there were two more, but they were FM tracks, frequency modulated tracks associated with the Vision. So you couldn't you couldn't split them away from the Vision. The two tracks themselves, of course, were a bit limiting. You could do you could do stereo, but then you had no method of Bouncing. dumping stuff up and down from one. Um, to, to be able to do a sound mix across a join, which is what we as videotape editors always did because personally I was working on football or cricket or something like that that was on the air in two hours time and I, uh, there was no, no way could it go off to a sound dubbing suite to get done. We had to do it all. So you couldn't, unacceptable to cut effects, cut football effects, no, absolutely not. You had to mix it together. So there had to be ways of doing that. So we either did it by using one track, working in mono, using one track as a bounce track, or we had to have a quarter inch machine running alongside and use that as the bounce machine. And that was a little bit tricky because that run up was, um, Different. was <laughs> all over the place and you had to resync it. But that goes back to two inch days. It wasn't until the four track machines came into use and more sophisticated bounce machines that we got really down to the nitty gritty of making high quality sports highlights, which is what I specialized in very quickly to a very high standard. Um, still using one of these effectively. A few more bells and whistles came along with a, with a later version called the uh, 2000. So when one inch came along, that revolutionized that. Match of the day in those days with the video disc, you edited your match, you left the holes, you had to wait for the video disc to become available to drop in the slow motions. As soon as one inch came, you could do it all yourself on the front panel. With these, you could do it on here. You could drive the slow-mo from here. You could teach it to, to slow motion. You could motion. also learn. If, yeah. you, if you had half an hour, you could teach it to learn. Otherwise, normally you just do it, do it 
with your finger, you just became adept at driving the tape. If you want to just freeze on a particular point and go on, you could do all that, drop it in. Everything became much more flexible, the production's got better, more sophisticated, but that's what technology did for you. Increasing technology, increasing program complexity and speed as well. Things could happen a lot faster. But yes, we dealt with um, with little um, camera DV tapes was another thing we used to use on Ski Sunday for the downhill run where Graham Bell would, would um, have his little camcorder in his hand and go screaming down the mountain with his little camera and he would talk, he'd hold it like that and he'd, he'd go, oh, here we can come out the tunnel jump now. Oh, oh, this is good. And he'd go on down and he'd go, and that tape would come back to Television Centre and I would stick it into the suite with one of these and make the downhill run for the Sunday transmission. Um, so that was a sort of a, so we needed a machine that could play DV and if we um, normally we would copy that onto a beta SP or to one inch so that it could stay in the library and not get lost because the DV tapes are so tiny but that's just another advancing technology needing to get that material into a format so you can get it out on the air and that was working with sound on two inch tape became a little bit easier on one inch because we had more soundtracks to play with. You could play sound up and down, mix in this, mix in a bit of that, easier. Come to here with an edit controller, much easier. You could dingle your sound, put it where you wanted on any of the four tracks if you had a four track machine. Um, and you, you just got used to mixing the whole thing. We would make stories and then uh, your Alan Hansons would want to talk over that story. When we didn't have razor blades now, no, we were modern era so we would dub they'd go into a dubbing booth and we would mix the sound in with the original meeting perhaps meeting music points perhaps meeting sync sound getting all that to work and that's why videotape editors were quite actually proficient at dealing with sound because they'd done it from square one